Hi everyone, my name is Zoe, and today I'm going to be reading a short story from this book, Flying Lessons and Other Stories. This book is a collection of short stories written by a number of really amazing authors, and I highly recommend that you check out this book from your local library or your local bookstore, or however you can get your hands on it. I'm going to be reading a, the story by the last author on this list, Jacqueline Woodson. The story is called Main Street. I'm going to be stopping a couple of times throughout the story to ask some questions to help you think about what's really going on. I hope that you enjoy this story, and I hope that you check out this book. Main Street by Jacqueline Woodson. Autumn now. The leaves here in New Hampshire are the ones on postcards. Bright red, heartbreaking gold. Color so deep and intense, it seems it doesn't belong in nature. They sell the postcards at the pharmacy on Main Street, and tourists buy tons of them scribbling things like gorgeous here right out of our town bringing you home some homemade maple syrup and i can imagine living here one day celeste said that's how her mother found peterborough she had come up with a busload of people wanting to see the leaves turn colors and she said to herself maybe one day i'll live here celeste said maybe she was so busy looking at the colored leaves she didn't turn around to see that the leaves were the only color in this town now go back and look at the parts that I've underlined here. These are italicized things that people written, had written in the postcards. What do they say? What do they say about the setting? What do they tell us about the rest of the story? How is this an appropriate thing to put in an introductory paragraph? There's a coffee shop on Main, right next to the pharmacy. Even though egg creams weren't always on the menu, the people coming here to look at the leaves kept asking for them. So the owner finally added them, and people from the city drink them by the gallon and write their postcards. I haven't learned to like egg creams, but I sit in the coffee shop some days, drinking Cokes and looking over people's shoulder to watch them write the same things over and over and over. Sometimes I think I'll see Celeste getting out of a car and running into the drugstore with her mother. But Celeste's gone now. Then this town is both completely different and absolutely the same without her. Last winter, the snow fell so long and rose so high, my father hired a man from Keene to plow it. When the man arrived, his huge plow moved silently through the mass of snow. The silence surprised me. How could so much power exist inside such quiet? As I watched, pressing my head against the window, I said to my father, I want to move the world through the world that quietly, that powerfully. Now, I want you to pause here and read that sentence over again. What does this say about our main character, that she wants to be quiet yet powerful? Is this a positive character trait, a negative? What does it set up for us about her? Okay, pause the video if you want to think about that further, but I'll keep going. Where did you come from? My father said, his eyes at once worry, his eyes at once laughing and worried. I had... A mother once, I said, into the pain. She used to say things. Don't say that, my father said. You still do. Don't ever say that. But he's wrong. I don't have a mother anymore. It's just my father now, and the leaves, and the snow, and the memory. These things you're not allowed to say. When I was young, it was the curses I heard my mother use, the words erupting from her mouth, but disconnected. Too ugly to belong to someone as beautiful as my mother. Once... One morning, I stood in the front of the mirror, saying words over and over. So, saying the words over and over. My father found me this way. Neither of us knew exactly. Eight days from that moment, my mother would move on to the next place. We thought the doctors were wrong. We prayed, "Please, doctors, in the name of our holy father, be wrong." What are you saying? My father said when he heard me. Don't ever say those words ever. But Mama says them. She's in pain, my father said. Those words should only be said by people in pain. I wanted to tell him I was in pain. I wanted to show him where it hurt, point to my head, my heart, my belly, say here, daddy, and here and here. But I didn't. I was eight years old. He was too young to know. He would say I was too young to know real pain. After all, he'd say, you'd never even had a skin knee tree talk. Then rub my head and smile, that halfway real halfway crying smile. That winter, I hurt every place my mother hurt I, as I pressed wet cloths to her sweating forehead, as I let her hold my hand to wait out the pain, as I read from her gossip magazines and gently brushed her thin hair. 
each twist of pain moving through me, moving through her, moved through me. And I wanted to tell my father this, that once I had lived inside my mother, a part of her, I wanted to say, how could I not know her pain? What kind of name is Treetop anyway? Celeste asked the first time she heard my father call me this. We were nine years old and Celeste was my new best friend. She had moved to New Hampshire from New York City. She was tall and brown and beautiful. Her mother had models for magazines. The first time I asked where babies came from, he said, treetops. Celeste squinted, pulled her lips to the side. I practiced doing this in the mirror, but I never looked all amazing. I never looked the all amazing thing hers looked. You know that's not true, right? Yeah, of course, but the name stuck. My dad would never say that, Celeste told me. He'd just say, look it up. But he'd never call me, look it up, just saying. So I want you to pause and think here. Are Celeste and the main character uh, foils, meaning that they're opposite? Are they not parallel characters in this story? Like it might be obvious to think they're best friends, so they're parallel characters. Are they actually opposite? Are they actually foils? How could this be an example of that? If you think that, then why? Pause and think about that. There's no right answer. Okay, I'll continue. We laughed. From the moment we became friends, it seemed we spent so much time, so much of our time laughing. She told me her father spent his days figuring out what to do with other people's money. He liked counting it, she said, and recounting and recounting. He's tall like me, she said. She said her parents were taking a break from each other. After all, 11 years was a long time to be together, don't you think? I shrugged. When my mother died, she and my father had been together for 20 years. They had been middle, middle school sweethearts. My father said he couldn't imagine living a life without her. I didn't tell Celeste this. I didn't say, the people who don't want breaks sometimes get them. But maybe she saw something in the way I stared at the ground. We were at the park, which was empty and cold. We were dragging our feet below in the swings, moving back and forth. You miss her, huh? I nodded. I miss my dad, Celeste said. I miss New York. I know me some missing. Think about this little section here, starting with I miss my dad. What does this foreshadow? What is the author trying to tell us is going to happen? I want you to think about that before I continue, because I think that this is a really telling part of the story. I looked up and she was smiling. Then we were laughing again. That quickly, we were looking at each other and laughing so hard we had to bend over, nearly, nearly falling out of our swings. I had never known anyone brown, and Celeste had never lived in a place where brown people didn't. It's Negroless, she said, smiling. It's a Negro-free zone. I thought we didn't use that word anymore. Celeste looked at me. You can't, but I can. It's in the language rule book, I swear. You're lying, right? There isn't a, really a language rule book. Nope. Not lying. There are all kinds of rule books. The New Hampshire rule book says that one family, that only one family that's not white can live here at a time. When I move away, another family will come here. I swear, it's in the rule book. Celeste looked at me a moment, then I smiled. I swear, but you're not gonna move away. I wasn't smiling. Not tomorrow. That was the year my other friends disappeared. One by one, they wanted to know why. When we had all been friends since forever, I needed this new friend now. The one black person my mother knew, Stolza, Casey said. They love rap music, Elizabeth said. Does she teach you dances? Celeste plays piano, I said quietly. She's been playing since she was small. Beethoven, she can play Beethoven. The others and I were still friends then, our dolls between our laps, their blonde hair getting wrapped into braids and curls and cut and dyed. I sat in the pink bedrooms. I sat in their pink bedrooms. The rooms I'd sat in for as long as I could sit alone and listened without knowing what to say back. It hurts here and here, I was thinking. And I don't know why it hurts, but it does. Are you scared, they asked? She might take things from you. She might have a gun or a knife. Her feet are big. Her hair is strange. There was one... One at our school once, do you remember? She was adopted or something? That's all I remember. My mom said you shouldn't eat with the new one. You shouldn't 
She said, I shouldn't eat with the new one. You shouldn't either. The last arrived long after the doctors told my mom there was nothing they could do. At, and the night after, in the night, my father sat behind the bedroom door, gulping, gulping back sobs. She arrived long after we buried my mother, my father and me at the graveside, our gloved hands locked together. Elizabeth and Casey behind me, standing between their own parents, safe from cancer and dead parents, and holes open in the ground. Celeste arrived in the late winter and smiled at me. Your mom would be mad if she knew, Elizabeth and Casey said. Celeste pulled me through town, making me name the trees we passed. White birch, barberry, sugar maple, catalog, but how do you do that again? How do you do that? She asked again and again. How do you know? Black walnut, beech, oat, pine, oak, pine, I said. Because I loved the feeling of her hand in mind. Loved the surprising softness. I didn't tell her, and I never told I didn't tell her I had never touched a black person before and how surprised I was the first time I touched her hair. But the second time I reached for it, Celeste's hand shot up, caught mine just inches from her head. Stop, she said when I was reaching for her hair. I'm not a dog to be petted. The following autumn, we buried Celeste's pet rabbit Joe in her backyard, sprinkling crushed leaves over his tiny grave. We had been friends for close to a year, and somewhere in that time we had grown to the same height. We wore our jeans rolled at the ankle and tied our shirts in matching knots at our waist. Celeste wore her hair out, an amazing black halo floating over her head. I had learned to keep my hands out of it, but at school she was constantly slapping other kids' hands away. Some mornings when she thought no one was looking, I saw her face dip into a sadness that I had only seen on my father. Those days I wanted to grab her hand Hold on tight and hold on tight. But we were 11. What did we know about anything? Spring came again. I like your treetop, Celeste said to me one morning, but I don't like it here. But you love the leaves and egg creams. My mom said we'd give it a year. It's been more than a year, Celeste said. She wouldn't look at me, and then finally she did. New York's only four and a half hours away. I know. We both knew the distance between New York and New Hampshire were forever away a whole lifetime. Celeste laced her fingers inside of mine. The way her fingers go, she said, brown way, brown way, brown way. It's like the same God or Mother Nature or Universe that decided to make the leaves here all crazy colored, said this. She held up her hands. This is right, too. Some afternoons, Elizabeth and Casey meet me at the pharmacy on Main Street, and the other three of us sit in the window where we can, and the three of us sit in the window where we can watch people moving through town. Before she moved back, Celeste and I made a promise that we'd meet in New York City and celebrate our 18th, birthday to, 18th birthdays together. In a week, I'd be 12. It'll be here before you know, Celeste said. Why are you squinting, Elizabeth asked. You act like you're not even here. And she's all right. And she's right, I'm already leaving. I'm halfway gone. All right, I want you to think about how these last couple sentences here could be used in an essay that is answering the question how Celeste's um, discomfort is shown by the author and how it's felt in readers um, without blatantly saying that she is upset or struggling. Um, what are some other examples besides this one that I'm pointing to here from throughout the story? Well, how could you prove that the author is showing, not telling um, Celeste's pain in society and in New Hampshire? I also have created some other discussion questions and debate questions and essay questions and comprehension questions that you can see um, attached. So I hope you really enjoyed this story. I think it's a really um, topical story to the time we're in right now. And I hope that you enjoyed it.